pulled up again. Hi, welcome everybody. This is Points in the Paint brought to you by For Fantasy Sake. I'm Andrew. This is my partner, Samuel. We are going to hey. be talking about a variety of things going on in the NBA. Uh, last week, we hit on the trade going down between Brooklyn, Houston, Indiana, and um, there's another team, Cleveland. Cleveland, and they um, not getting to see a whole lot of those players in action. We saw them in action this week. And uh, we'll, we'll hit on that. We'll hit on a few different other things going on with the trade and kind of what that that means for a variety of the teams. Um, so let's let's start off with what Sam wants to talk about. Uh, he's been dying to talk about the big. <laughs> uh, oh, yeah. I mean, he sent us a group chat uh, two days ago, and I know he's been chomping at the bit. So I know everybody was, you know, really excited, you know, when you heard about, you know, the idea of James Harden team, teaming up with Kevin Durant and Kyrie Irving in Brooklyn to form a new big three. And, you know, rightfully so. You should. I mean, that's, you know, that's box office. You know, that'd be that's great. Um, but obviously, you know, they and they actually played their first game um, yesterday. They played uh, the Cleveland Cavaliers. I mean, it's only one game. It's, it's a small sample size. Um, they, they lost to the Cavs, 135, 147. Um, but, you know, the thing with this trade and this team and even leading up to this before this trade even happened was there's too many guys that need the ball in their hands for to score and not enough guys that can defend on the other end. And so you give up 147 points to the Cleveland Cavaliers, who are the second worst offensive rated team in the NBA. And they weren't even playing. They were playing without Kevin Love and another uh, and Darius Garland, another one of their uh, primary scorers. And you gave up almost 150 points to them. I will and say it's, in, the, in the next defense, in the next defense, they played an extra 10 minutes. So this game went into double overtime, and yeah. there were there were several times where Brooklyn should have had the game won. They should have put it away, and they they had it in the bag, and they let Cleveland back in. Um, I know, Sam. You didn't. You weren't able to 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 watch the game on television. That you were paying attention to it on GameCast and the box score yeah. pulled up. Um, but just watching it, the the Nets looked, looked awful on defense. Transitional yeah. defense was terrible. When they got actually got the ball slowed down, they couldn't stop the swing pass. They they didn't rebound. Drummond and Jared Allen just killed them in the paint, um, and they got into a lot of foul trouble. I mean, James Harden. And the at the start of overtime was playing with five fouls, and if you're if you're having your big three and that's what you're going to rely on, you can't let those guys get into foul trouble, especially going into a big game like that. I agree, and I'm looking at the and I'm I'm looking at the um, score by quarter, and like in the overtime alone, um, the Nets gave up thirty five. 34 points to the Cavs in those two overtimes, which is crazy. I mean, because overtime is only like five minutes. So, I mean, in 10 minutes, you gave up 34 points. I mean, that's, what is that, like almost a little bit over three and a half points per minute, like, you know, at that pace, which is ridiculous. And I'm looking, and I, I went back and watched some of the highlights today, this morning, um, um, just to kind of, because I really want to see this. And, like, I look at this, the Nets team, and I mean, on their team, they got a lot of like they got you know they got some good players you know and I mean they got some good role players like Jeff Green and DeAndre Jordan but I mean DeAndre Jordan isn't the same you know the f player he was you know like six years ago he's 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 solid you know but he's never been a, a lockdown defender he's a shot blocker you know maybe a good help side defender strong rebounder but I mean he's not gonna he's not gonna lock anybody up. I mean, Kevin Durant's probably your best bet at being a, a defender, and that's obviously because Kevin Durant's got those intangibles, that 6'11", 7-foot wingspan, you know, so he can, you know, definitely, you know, make things difficult for a lot of perimeter players or even bigs down, you know. But besides that, I mean, Kev, uh, Kyrie Irving, James Harden, these guys aren't known defenders. I mean, I'm, I mean, J Joe Harris, Landry Shamit, you know, these other their bench players, none of the guys on Brooklyn – you know, they don't scare me, like, from a defensive standpoint. I mean, yeah, Harden, Durant, and Kyrie, um, that's a nasty trio. And they can, you know, they'll 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 probably average, you know, uh, the three, they'll probably put up, like, 100-plus points to three of them, which is easy. But, I mean, if you're counting on those three players, night in and night out, 
to out to to score that much points, it's it's not going to work. You're going to run into a bus on, especially in the Eastern Conference too. Like, I don't even think these guys are making out of the Eastern Conference. I think they'll lose in the finals, and they might lose in the semifinals. I I will not be surprised if they lost in the semifinals to like a Boston or another, you know, a Miami or a team that's a, a, a team that's you know been playing together. That's playing really good team defense. So. I 100% agree with that. Uh, Brooklyn needs to get their act together, and if they're if they're they they didn't play bad on offense last night. You know, putting up that no. many points nine times out of ten, you're gonna win basketball games. But when you give up that many points, you're gonna lose basketball games every single time. Um. So that and how many points did the big their big three have combined? They had like it was like 90 points. I can tell you in just a second. Uh, Durant had 38, Kyrie had 37, and Harden had 21. Um, so that was that 30, 30, 20, like 80, 80. almost 90 points, and they only scored 130, right? That 96 points if I did my math right. right. I hope I did my math right. <laughs> but yeah, they scored 135 points, and these guys might have had like almost like. <laughs> Literally, almost like seventy five percent of their points, and yeah. two James Harden only took James Harden only took fourteen shots. He was six for fourteen um, overall. He was three for six. Like I, I'm, I'm pretty sure he was probably deferring a lot to Kyrie because Kyrie had been out for those um, seven games. Because um, Kyrie took twenty eight shots and Kevin Durant took twenty five. That is something I noticed watching the game is yeah. that when they went down. Cleveland only guard was really only guarding the big three. Because yeah. when Harden drove the lane and looked to pass it out, he was looking for Durant or Kyrie. He wasn't looking for, for anybody else. And there was times where Joe Harris was open for three. There was times where um, where Green was open for three as well. And I just I didn't understand that trust. And maybe that's just going to take time for them to kind of develop yeah. that. Uh, this was their first game playing together. Um so I, I would imagine that next time, that over the next few weeks, Brooklyn works out these kinks and they wind up being a powerhouse. But as as of right now, like you said, I can't make it, I can't see him making it out of the semi semifinals. I mean, the thing with you know that too is you know having a big three like that, which are talented. But I mean, Durant played fifty minutes, Kyrie played forty eight minutes, and James Harden played fifty one minutes. I mean, it's January, and you got and you got to play these minutes, and they're, I mean, they're only. Or they nine and seven. I mean, they're capable of probably reeling off all these wins versus bottom feeding teams. They're probably going to feast on my Bulls when, we, when they play the Chicago Bulls and some of these other teams, um, these lesser teams in the Eastern Conference. But like, I mean, a team like Cleveland is a team that they should beat. But I mean, this is early, like you said. They're going to need time to get their reps together. But I mean, it's going to be really difficult too with, uh, you know, so many games being pressed together and the schedule, just like how it was for the Clippers last year. If you know, like with Kawhi and Paul George doing their low management and they never practice together, like you know, these repetitions, it's going to be really difficult, you know, for these, you know, this team to get it together. I think Brooklyn should probably sign some free agents. You know, they, I mean, some, you know, veteran, you know, some players on the veteran contract. There's some. I mean, there's got to be some guys out there. I mean, if I could just think off the top of my head, a guy like Deion Waiters, who, you know, could be a nice little guard off the bench for them, you know, can score um, and can kind of facilitate, take pressure off Kyrie. Um, Michael Beasley, he can score as well. But, like, all the guys I'm thinking of, they're all offensive guys too. I, I don't know, like, any, like, defensive studs that are, like, still out there unless you want to, like, try to see, like, if you can get some, like, a guy like Michael Kidd Gilchrist, if he's available, you know, some uh, other like 3 and D type players. I mean, but you're going to have to tweak that roster a little bit and you know, you're going to have to like also come together at the same time. So you're going to have to add pieces and then and then gel at the same time, you know, if you even want to have a chance of competing in the East. Exactly. And it's funny It's funny that you bring up the balls. I don't know if you, if you heard the, uh, the Billy Donovan's uh, – press conference after one of the games. I can't remember what game it was. Oklahoma he, City? Yeah, I think it was Oklahoma City, and he called Kobe or Kobe White out for heat checks, and he said the same thing about Zach Levine. Is that the – yeah, because uh, the, the Oklahoma City game, excuse me, was like last week, and we were up by like 20-something. 
And I remember watching that game, and I'm like, okay, there we go. Like, you know, everybody looked, the offense is free-flowing. You know, Lowry's back. He's playing good. Kobe and Zach, you know, they've been good all year. Wendell's doing his thing. I'm like, yeah, it's a game we should win, you know. You know, my, my baby bulls are really growing up. You're watching them learn, you know, piece together wins. You know, these are wins that we wouldn't have two, three years ago. And then I check it, or I check Twitter, and I see something about how we lost. And I'm like, and I was like, I was dumped on. Like, how did you lose that game? And that's the thing too with Kobe and Kobe's good. You know, Kobe and, and and Zach is. I mean, if you watch Zach play, it's like I mean his jumpers effort, effortlessly. Like I mean, he literally can get off a three anytime because he's so athletic. And more often times than not, his street falls. Like he's like he's a really good shooter, so I can see why he can kind of you know fall in love with that jump shot. But what I am seeing from Zach is he's picking and choosing his point his um his times when to attack. He's he's better at picking and choosing. Like I think we played Dallas that Sunday. Mm-hmm. And, we won, and we won, yeah, and we won that game. And that game too. I mean, the house was kind of up, but then we, you know, settled in. And I, even that game, Zach and Kobe didn't even shoot. They barely. I think Kobe had like ten points, and or Kobe had like four points, and Zach had like ten. And we and we beat we beat the breaks off Dallas. Then we played Houston that following night, and we beat Houston. So those two guards, they're young. And they're promising, but they're they're good, but they're coming into their own. Especially Kobe. Kobe's only twenty. You know, he played one year of college ball. Zach's been, you know, Zach's been our stable stabilizing force, but Zach's only twenty five still at the end of the day. But I love those two guards moving forward. And what I really love from Kobe is his playmaking is getting better. He's he's averaging more assists now. I think his assists are like upwards of seven, eight. I think he had double digits assists over game. And I'm like, yeah, that's what I like to see. I want my point guard. They have like ten plus assists, but at the same time, be able to you know know when pick and choose when I can score and have an impact. Like Steve Nash, a perfect example. Steve Nash runs that pick and roll, get you an assist, come off, get you a three. I mean, you can finish with twenty and ten like easily, like you know. And I mean, if, if you have Kobe and Zach, you know, both you know scoring an upper fifteen plus points, Zach's probably thirty. You know, you could book him for thirty and night easily. And then you have Lowry as a third option, and Lowry's a bad boy. He's a seven footer. Big man with range. I mean, you have your other peaches, your Denzel Valentines, you have your Garrett Temples, your Otto Porter Jr., you have your Patrick Williams. Like We have a le- legit young team, and I'm really excited to see where the Bulls continue to go. And I love Billy Donovan. I've been watching Billy Donovan since he played at Fo- Coach Florida in 2006. Like I remember when they beat UCLA for the national championship in Ohio State the following year, yeah, t- in 2007 with Greg Oden and, and them boys. So, yeah, I've been, I've been a big Billy Donovan fan for, for years. So we have a really good coach in place. Good management in place, and we got the players in place. So the Bulls are definitely trending upward in my book. Greg Oden, that's the name I haven't heard in forever. Yeah. <laughs> remember, you remember that? <laughs> that's probably the biggest bust in NBA history. Yeah. But, um, but that's the thing with the Bulls is that Zach, Zach is really, has really come into his own playing point guard in a position where I didn't think he was going to be able to. I didn't know how well that was going to go. And he's really found his rhythm. He's he's been able to find open guys and get him good looks. And like you said, he's been very selective with whether he takes the points or if he goes after the assist. And I've been really happy with how he's played. It's like he it's like I mean and I mean even me, I mean, and all of us, we all relate. It's like when as you get older, it's like things start to slow down in a sense for you. Um, and I mean, life and just in general, I mean, maybe, you know, it's, or you just, you just get used to it. And as, as far as being a basketball player, Zach's like, yeah, I can blow by this guy, you know, all the time and get to the rim. And I, or maybe I could just blow by and instead of going to the rim, hey, I could just kick it out to my shooter right there. Or, you know, or I can, I can, or I, if I get the ball on the perimeter instead of shooting it, I could just quick touch pass to the guy next to me. And I've seen Zach do a lot of smart plays and especially defensively too. Like he gets out there defensively. Like I've loved like watching Zach's growth in Chicago these last like with three years, 2017, you know, each and every year he's gotten better, you know, and I, I definitely, and he's got that, that clutch chain in them or that, that, well, that dog in them. Let's just say that like that when the, when times get go, when the times get hard or the time to put the team away, like he wants the ball in his hands and he's, and he's not running from the moment. You know, you see that like, he doesn't have fear in his eyes, and that's what I love most about him. So that's why I'm glad he's still on our team. And I'm and I I get mad when I always hear the Bulls trade rumors for Zach Levine, Zach Levine. But I think that's more so other teams want Zach. We want to keep Zach in Chicago in our yep. core. Other teams are oh he's on a nice contract and all this and that. I want Zach to retire, bull. He's only 25. You know when this when this next contract's up, let's sign him to a super max. You know, put him through. You know, like you know for the rest of his prime in Chicago. Like he's still got you know. 
10 plus years of playing at a high level. Like, and the fact that he can shoot so well, coupled with that athleticism and just the smarts, and then having like Donovan around, I mean, the sky's the limit for this guy. So, yeah, the Bulls have a very bright future. And I think that they're, I think if they continue to play well this season, I think they sneak in to the bottom of that playoff race and they may even surprise some teams. Yeah, that be, are they, they're still doing the um, play in things for the playoffs this year, too. So they'll be like, You'll have your what your your six your six seeds and be like what the bottom two seed mm-hmm. or like four or so they'll, be, they'll be playing again. So yeah, there's no reason why the Chicago Bulls should not be one of those teams playing. We should have been last year because I remember we didn't they didn't get invited to the bubble and we were like literally on the cusp of the AC in the East. So that was kind of disappointing. Um, but this year, you know, with our team, I mean, I think we I think we definitely have a chance. And I mean, like the losing that OKC game was was tough. I mean, heck, losing the game to the Clippers that was was the week before was also tough. That one was a, a game I thought we should have won. Um, and then losing to the Lakers was also tough. I mean, it's the Lakers, but, I mean, that's still a game I think we could have kind of stole. But um, we're competing in these games. You know, we're not we're not folding. We're competing. You know, the guys believe in each other. They're playing for each other. You know, I just like the energy of a team this year, you know, and I'm, I'm really big on energy, you know, and just, you know, how outside energy influences you, whether you're positive or negative and how that just impacts your mood or, you know, how you perceive things or how you, you know, move forward from that. So our energy is definitely, like, in the right place. Like, hey, we're down, but we can battle back and we can get back in the games. So, uh, Yeah. Yeah, and like you said, they've been in very, very winnable games and put themselves yeah. in situations to win those games or at least compete when you wouldn't think that they would have, like against the Lakers, against the Clippers, beating the Mavericks. So those those are games that are testing them, and they're only going to grow from that experience. So I, I do agree with you that you know they're, they're going to be a force to be reckoned with here, maybe even next season. Yeah. Um, but earlier you brought up, you know, trading. I don't think they're going to trade, you know, Zach at all. But now on the trade block is is uh, Kevin Porter from Cleveland. I don't. You heard you you had to have heard this story about he had a melt, meltdown or something, and he like exploded on the coach and they're. Yeah. So he was away from the team from an illness, an injury. Mm-hmm. I don't remember what it was, but he came back and. And this was right after the tr- big trade went down for Harden that ended up sending um, Jared Allen and Prince, Torian Prince, to the uh, to the Cleveland Cavaliers. Mm-hmm. The Cavs gave Torian Prince Kevin Porter's locker. And Porter did not like that. Freaked out on the coach, went to management, yelled at them, and just – he didn't really handle the situation well. And – I mean, I don't know if I would have either, um, you know, I'm it, yeah. and I come back, you know, thinking that I have a spot and then I find out my locker has gone because you gave it to somebody else. I'm also, I'm also not a guy that's going to get upset that you gave my locker spot to somebody. I'm going to go find a different locker because I'm assuming you just moved me from one place to another, but maybe, I, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe it's, Hey, you know, we're, we're you're a reserve now. I, I don't know what that full story is. If I read it correctly, and, and I could be wrong, but I think if they moved his locker to like, the equipment room or something like that, it wasn't even like next to other players' locker. They moved, they moved his stuff. Yeah, okay. Sources say Porter, whose locker was moved to the wall where the younger end of bench players resides, began yelling in the, at one point through food. Yep, he threw food. <laughs> food fight. <laughs> <laughs> But that's the thing is that you, they moved him to another spot in the locker room. Granted, it was with the the guys that probably aren't going to be playing, you know, near as much. Um, but you had to have seen that coming when they brought in other players who also play your position. Not not Jared Allen, but in Torian Prince. Yeah. And obviously, they made that move, and they 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 got them because you weren't performing to your expectations being a first round pick. So I, I guess I see a little bit of both sides, but at the same time, I, I still think that um, I think he's a good player. I think he'll go somewhere, but um, that I know I saw that they just put him on the trade block today and are, shop, are shopping him for teams. And I don't, I don't know where he, he's going to end up going. So what's unfortunate about that since that incident was so public and everything, 
teams are like, like, well, you're probably going to release him if you can't trade him because he's on his rookie contract. So why would we give you anything for him when we could just wait for him to release him and then claim on waivers? So I think he's going to probably end up getting released unless the team wants to, like, dangle a, a second round pick or something in Cleveland. But they they might just be like, well, we'll just wait for him to get released and then we can swoop him and pick him up. Like, I mean, I'm looking at um, his his uh, information now. He's only 20 years old. He's just, I mean, he's going to be 24 or 20, I'm sorry, 21 this May. Um, but he's, so he's really, very, very young. Um, and his first year, he aver- I mean, he averaged like 10 points, three rebounds, two assists. Now, I remember him come, kind of coming on late last year for Cleveland. I remember seeing that name, Kevin Porter, because I always confuse that with Otto Porter that plays for the yeah. Bulls, but I'm saying Porter. So, um, and then when I looked at he played at USC, and I'm like, oh, you know, I, I know USC has a couple guys come out for basketball, like DeMar DeRozan, every now and then, a, a, you know, a stud will come out of USC. So, um, but yeah, you know, so he's young enough. I mean, obviously, this is just something that, you know, he'll have to live down the incident. But I mean, he's, I mean, he's, he can, he'll go to another team. I think he just needs a fresh start. Um, obviously, maybe him. I want to say his, he was gone. I think they said it was like mental health or something. I might, I can't be sure. I mean, they were just there, just, li- they were just listening as personal reasons. But, um, yeah, and I thought, and I thought they said, they said personal reasons. I, they might have said injury in there or an, an, an illness related incident, something along those lines. Um, but I'm sure, like you said, I'm sure he'll find a home. I just thought it was, it was kind of a, an overreaction on his part. I don't know how much that hurts yeah. his stock going to another team. Yeah. But we'll, we'll kind of, we'll kind of move over. That's, that's one kind of story that's evolved from this giant James Harden trade. Another one is over in India, uh, Indiana, where doctors, end up performing an MRI on um, Karis LeVert. And now he's done for quite possibly the year because they found tumors and that are life threatening. I didn't know that was, a, I didn't know he was done for the year. Cause they just, it, they left it so bad. They were just like, Oh, we don't know what's going to happen next. I did I actually thought he might return, but I mean, actually, if you think about it, like with the whole Chris Bosch thing, they shut him down for the year. Brandon Ding and our shut him down for the year. But if it's tumors or something like that, yeah, he'd probably be done for the year, which would be unfortunate. And I, I, I've been watching Karis LeVert. I'm not sure if you're a college basketball guy, but I am, I'm a Big Ten guy. I went to Iowa, so I watched him when he played at you know Michigan when he played with the uh, I can't remember who who he played with there. I think Stouts, Nick Stauskas and um, Mo, Wag- Mo Wagner and um, Big Tim Hardaway Jr. Trey Burke and them, and them boys. So he he's around right, right around those that time. Um, I think they compared Wagner. that team to the uh, to the Fab Five. Yeah, 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 <laughs> yeah. And it's funny now because Juwan Howard's coaching. Uh, they're the head coach now, and they got them. He's got them playing out of his mind. But yeah, it's such a careful work. Because remember, he had that. He had a really bad leg injury a couple of years ago, but he came back from. It was like a. And I remember he dealt with a lot of injuries. I remember that that was a knock on him in college because I remember he got he was injured a lot. But I remember when he played, he was like he's so good. He's just he's just silky. You know his game was just smooth. You know he and it just everything was just effortlessly to him. So you know hearing that he's got this injury and all this and that, it's um it's unfortunate. And I I hope he can come back and play this year. Um, but that's un- that's really unfortunate if it shuts him down for the year because it's, it's it's I mean it's generally though when they say indefinitely i just i just err on the side of caution and say that they're probably going to be out for the year because like you said in the past they have been out with chris bosh with brandon ingram you know look at any other sporting injuries where they're having you know these types of medical issues and they're going to set those guys aside and say hey take care of what you need to take care of because we need you back here and we can't have you you know playing here when you're not at a hundred percent. And I, and I can imagine that that's probably weighing on his mind right now. So he's probably not going to be able to be going to be able to focus on basketball a hundred percent. I know I wouldn't. Be able to. I'm looking at an article and they're saying could face a six week recovery, but they're still not, they're just being so vague and mm-hmm. whatnot about like what, actually you know what actually is going to go on or what's going to happen so i i hope and i and i he's such a talented player and he's young too i think he's like 26 27 i hope he can you know 
make a full recovery from this and come back because he's like watching them play. He just loves to play the game. Like, you know, he loves to play the game. So just imagine if maybe, I mean, basketball side, you know, Andrew, just think about something you love to do. Suddenly that's taken away from you. You can't ever do that again. You know, obviously you're going to be kind of on edge, stuff like that. So I'm hoping it's um, something that, um, something that they, you know, can remedy and it's not anything long term. Um, but it's unfortunate, man. Yeah, he was one of my favorite players coming out of the bubble um, because I I kind of lost track of him after he got drafted and didn't really – apparently he was drafted by the Pacers, so now he's back with the Pacers. Yeah, I and, didn't even know that. Yeah, and he – over the offseason signed a three-year deal with the with the Nets for 52 mil, 52 and a half mil, something, something, somewhere in that ballpark. So he's getting good money to – to, to play and they shipped him off. Like I said, hope he comes back. He's a great player. And I, I think that he's going to be able to, uh, to do well in, uh, in Indiana. Sorry, my cat has joined. Everyone again. Um, but cat that's, cool. that's, that's one of the things that you and I were talking about before the show started was how, what is the progress of the process of going through these, you know, physical checks when these teams make these trades and why wasn't an MRI done prior to the trade going through? And cause I mean, this, this, if, Oh, I get what you're saying. Beforehand, this could have shut the whole thing down. You know what? In that bank, in that you, you raised a really good point. And if I had to say and guess the reason why, I would probably say it was probably not done before the trade went down because they did one before the season started, like a physical. So since he was medically cleared, um, and even he's saying in articles, "Oh, I felt fine. There's nothing wrong with me. I, 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 I don't think he wasn't injured. I mean, unless he was like with a little minor knickknacks, but nothing, you know, that would that would force them to do the MRI." I didn't know ankle sprains or anything like that. And if it was like an ankle, they would do the MRI on the ankle to determine. But it was nothing on his on his kidneys or anything to determine that that would even indicate that you know he was injured. Yeah. So I think yeah yeah. So the fact that he was cleared, you know, the fact that he was oh he was he had a physical in the beginning of the year and he was fine and he's been playing. You know, what I'm saying he, I don't think he's missed any time. There's no need to conduct a, a MRI, you know, before the trade goes down. Because I mean, I'm pretty sure a lot of these guys have so many injuries. Like you know, like I mean, if you even think about, you know, playing basketball for like 82 games. Heck, I play basketball twice a week and I'm beat up. So like, I know these guys, like you know, they 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 play. I mean, I, I mean, there's probably so many knickknack injuries that they have that um, stuff doesn't even get reported. Like, oh, does it hurt? Like, oh, not really. Okay, well, it's not an injury. Like you know, so, you know, like it's. I mean, oh, but you like, do you feel it? Is your kidney? Uh, Oh no, I didn't even I didn't even know that was there. Um this is actually similar to um um Shaquille O'Neal's son, Sharif O'Neal, when he was at UCLA. He had that uh, that blood injury right before he started the season. Like he had like a, a like a routine checkup and they discovered like this really serious issue that they had to operate on and it possibly saved this, this kid's life. I mean I, I mean it's I mean it set him back like two years and then he transferred to uh to uh LSU now, but like that was like the same thing, like you know, right before the season started. So like um it's really unfortunate, but not much you yeah. can do. Yeah, I mean, like you said, there's not much you can do about it, and just just hope that he winds up being okay and that he makes it through it, and that he's able to play uh, and get back to the stage that he was playing at again. Yeah, because um, he was playing at a high level before he got hurt. He was he was playing with a lot of confidence. He was off to a rocket start. Granted, that was with a team that you know a lot of the focus was on you know Kyrie and KD. But still, being that that third piece and being a you, they had to have game plan for him. Other teams had to have game plan for Karis Liver. There's no way that you just overlook him and just say no. We're gonna we're gonna keep our eyes on KD and Kyrie. I argue that they were a better team with Karis Levert, Jared Allen, and Spencer Dinwiddie and them boys before they traded for James Harden. They had more depth. I mean, Levert came off the bench too. So I mean, and they, I mean, you had you had a team <laughs> when you had Levert. Now you have like three alpha dogs, and you had like you know some guys, you know, and maybe you have a bunch of you know just guys trying to find where they fit in at. You had a team before, and and those guys, you know, they were like you know the core of that team before Kevin Durant and Kyrie came last year was still intact. Karis Levert has always been there. Jared Allen was there. Uh, what's his name? Joe Harris, uh, yeah. Torian Prince. They were there under Kenny Atkinson. 
Like the same thing with the Clippers. Remember how you heard about the Clippers and their drama? The Clippers had a team before Kawhi and uh, Paul George came. They had Pat Bev, Lou Williams, and and then like you brought these, you know, these guys, these eag- uh, these bigger, you know, these bigger name players, and then like and then now you suddenly you have to acquiesce to them, tr- butcher half your team because we're tr- trying to we're trying to win a championship, and then this that's where it leaves you. Yeah, I mean, you're you, at that point, you're kind of all in on this trade of bringing in the su- other superstar and saying, hey, it's going to be you three. You three are running the show. We are going to be trying to win basketball games, win a championship in the East with you guys. And uh, like I said, they gave up a lot of depth. Yeah. What do you think about uh, Steve Nash as a coach? I don't know if I ever asked you that. I like Steve Nash as a coach. I like him. I like I like Steve too. I like him as I liked him as a player. Uh, yeah, so I'm, a little, I'm a little biased towards it. I do remember hearing over this su- this summer. Um, I don't think it was the summer. It was spring when they hired him. When they brought Steve Nash on. Stephen A. Smith went off, and yeah, he played the race card. And I I didn't understand that. I didn't understand. What he, I understand, you know, that there are a lot of, you know, coaches out there in the league. Um, but I didn't understand why he singled out Steve Nash because I understand that Steve Nash didn't have a, a track record as a coach. But when you have a player that can pass down anything, everything that Steve, that somebody like Steve Nash knows, why, why would you pass that up? I think Stephen A. Smith's um, argument. Was it that Steve Nash got a head coaching job? I more so that Steve Nash got that head coaching job for that championship, that team that was ready for a championship. Like if Steve Nash really got hired as the Orlando Magic or heck, even the coach of the Chicago Bulls, you know, instead of Billy Donovan, he wouldn't bat an eye. Like, okay, like you know, because he's a rookie coach. I mean, whatever. Like you know, the Bulls aren't going to compete for a championship. But the fact that Steve Nash was able to get that uh, job. In Brooklyn, you know, with the, ch- the team that had championship championship aspirations, that's what rubbed Stephen A. Smith the wrong way. But S- Steve Nash and Kevin Durant are close. So when I saw that he got hired, because I remember hearing about how Steve Nash worked with yeah. Kevin Durant when he was in Golden State. So when I saw that he got hired, I'm like, oh, that's Kevin Durant. You know, that's you know, that's Brooklyn's brass appeasing their their top dog. They're just you know. They're just they're just trying to keep Kevin Durant happy. So I didn't even bat an eye about him. Like that's just a Kevin. That's Legit, Kevin Durant was was the one that they they hired him for. And yeah, that's that's what that's also another thing that I heard over there was that this wasn't a you know an ownership or a, a front office decision. I mean, it wasn't front office decision, but it was pushed and really forced into full throttle by Ke- by Kevin Durant and Kyrie. Is that they wanted Steve Nash to come in? Kyrie wanted them too. I that's what I yeah. what I think I remember. No, no. That, that makes sense. Kyrie, Kevin, Kevin probably approached Kyrie about that, and, and Kevin and Kyrie, obviously the two the leaders on the team, so they both they both wanted to be on the same page. And then they went to manager said we want Steve Nash. I think they even they um that's how they got Michael. The the Nets had Michael Beasley last year and on their team. And I'm not sure why he's not there this year, but he they signed him because he's friends with Durant or he childhood friends with Durant. So I mean that's obviously the reason why they signed him. Just like how on OKC was trying to keep Durant before he left. They traded for Oladipo and all this and that because that's a friend of Durant. You know, like, you know, teams do that all the time or try to appease the players. That's why at the end of the day, you know, granted the owners own the teams and whatnot, but, like, still the owner, the players control this league. You just see James Harden force his way to Brooklyn, you know, outside of Houston. The team he wanted to go to, he forced his way to. I mean, players have leverage, too, so it's, I mean, kind of crazy. I mean, obviously, you always hear about LeBron being a GM and all this and that, and, you know, if LeBron don't like you, you're going to get you're gonna get traded or whatnot, but um, players still hold a lot of leverage in this league, and I think that kind of just shows that. Um, and I'm not really too – I'm not really – honestly, I don't really think too much about the Steve Nash team because I'm like, this, these guys are so freaking good. They're, they're so talented. They really don't need a coach. I mean, they're, I mean, they do need a coach, and Steve Nash is a great coach for them because he's a point guard, so he sees all this stuff on the floor from that stand from a point guard standpoint. Um, and then they have, and, but then they surrounded Steve Nash with like veteran coaches. They surrounded with Mike D'Antoni and Amari Stoudemire, which I love. The Amari <laughs> Amari Stoudemire is coaching, you know. He's and then I mean they, and I'm not sure who else is on their roster, but they have, you know, veteran guys and and like Steve 
Nash, I think, is kind of, the kind of guy that's a player's coach. So, you know, players can come, you know, talk mm-hmm. to him and feel comfortable with him. So I think that, too, and that familiarity and that whatnot will just help, you know, will help, you know, Brooklyn long term. So not really, yeah, not really concerned with Steve Nash whatsoever, more so ever. I mean, that's, I get the hire, I get why it happened. So, but yeah, I, Steve Nate Smith, I fuck, he explodes over everything now. Like, I mean, I've been listening to this guy since I was in sixth grade, and it's like, like, he, like, I mean, I don't even want to. I didn't listen to him after the Steelers lost, but I'm pretty sure he was mad about the Steelers losing because the Steelers are his team. But like, he literally just like loses his marbles like over the littlest things. Like, like if you, hey, I'm like Steve, I'm like, I'm like, I'm like, it's just not that serious, you know. At the end of the day, but but I think that's why we watch Stephen A. Is so yeah. that we see him explode over the smallest details, and like we, and he takes things and he he makes it to an extreme to where we're just. We think it. We're like, well, we didn't really see this as a big deal, but now that you're bringing it up, and it might be, and we we buy into it. And you know what's funny too is, um, when I first when I first so when I was in, when I really wanted to get involved in, um, I did a little sports journalism in college, like you know, writing for you know my paper, but like I I wanted to work for ESPN and you know and along those lines. And it was because of Stephen A. Smith. I used to watch Sports Center, and he'd come on there, and I'm like, man. And I was always say, man, and he'd always come on NBA Tonight. And I'm like, man, I'm like, who's this passionate guy just coming in there talking? And he always like, and his facts were right. And I'm like, he's everything he said was right. And so I was like, man, like this guy comes on the, on the stage, and he just knows what he's talking about, and all this and that. And so when I was, and I got a minor in a sports study in college, and I was doing sports journalism, they, you know, some like classmates that nicknamed me, oh, you trying to be the next Stephen A. Smith? And that's all what they, they would always say to anybody who was trying to pursue those lines. Like, you trying to, like, you know, forget all the other 200 reporters that work for ESPN. No, you want to be the next Stephen A. Smith because he's so memorable. You can always remember who he is. Like, it's Stephen A. S- you know, Smith. Like, you know, so. No, I, I, you're a you're a Chicago guy, so you're more yeah. of a Michael Wilbon. <laughs> I love me Mike Wilbon, dude. Mike, I want to, I would love to meet Mike Wilbon someday. He's he's a man, dude. I watch him religiously. I follow him on social media, and he's just so even killed. But like, whenever he's tweeting about the Bears and stuff, uh, when he used to tweet about the Bears and like, I mean, back in those days, like Jay Cutler, and we just were not really going anywhere. Or, yep. You know, I, I, man, I felt for Mike Wilbon or just <laughs> next. I'm like, I, I know, man. It's 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 tough, but uh. Mike Mike Wilbon's a good guy, man. <laughs> That's the thing is he is our frustrations as Chicago fans. We sit there and we watch the games, and we've had those frustrations. And then Michael Wilbon echoes those frustrations out yeah. through his broadcast, yeah. and it's like, oh, glad we're not the only ones that feel this way. That the professionals also feel this way as well. But um. Yeah, Michael Wilbon, Stephen A. Smith, both both great guys to actually listen to. Uh, Stephen A. has some some hot takes, very hot takes, and is entertaining uh, to listen to. But Michael Wilbon, he'll actually you know tell it like it is. Just Stephen A. will as well. But uh, Michael Wilbon is is a is a Chicago Chicago home home uh, home fan. I, I and I that's and that's I have a lot of, you know love and affection for Mike Wilbon. Same thing with the uh, Scoop Jackson and God, so I can't remember these. Um, some of the other you no know, ESPN analysts. I mean that I've you know listened to, but I mean Stephen A. Smith is probably the most well known. But I mean, yeah, there's a um, and I guess with him in Brooklyn, Stephen A. You know he's a New York. He's from New York. He's from Hollis, Queens, if I'm if I'm correct. So he has ties to the Knicks. Like remember when the Knicks drafted? Did you ever see when he, the Knicks drafted Obi Toppin in his reaction video to that? Which I'm gonna say this too. Not so, and I have some friends um, who are uh, who live in New York, and I you know I talk to them all the time. I was talking to them another the day, but Knicks should have drafted Tyrese Halliburton. That you know he went to Sacramento, the point guard for there. I mean Obi Toppin's nice, but I mean you have you have like eight. Ford's already on your team. <laughs> like Julius Randle, Morris, uh, Reggie Bullock. Ar- I mean, you have like all these Fords. At Kevin Knox. I mean, and you drafted another Ford. And seeing that, oh, he's box office. He's all this and that. Oh, what? He can throw down a windmill dunk on a fast break. I'm like, he's not going to be- really be able to develop in New York behind all those other Fords. I mean, look how Julius Randle's playing now. Julius Randle's playing so much better now. When do you have time to play Obi Toppin? If you had Tyrese Halliburton in that Knicks offense with Tom Thibodeau, who you're very familiar with, in that system, you know how point guards thrive in Tibbs' system. Tyrese, 
we probably average like 18 points, five, six assists. In this, in this rookie year, he'd be a model of consistency. Granted, Emmanuel quickly, who they drafted later in the first round, who's turned out to be a gem for them, that's good. But heck, let's say you did grab Halliburton at that top pick, you know, that 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 pick that you took Obi Top in that. That other pick that you took quickly, you probably could have found another gem. Maybe a who knows what you could have found. Maybe a stash, a pro, a prospect to stash overseas. I mean, maybe you could have packaged that pick with Frank Ninakina. I pronounce his name, I'm sorry. Um, and then trade him because I don't think he's really a fit for what New York does. Um not, I mean, when the triangle offense, yeah, Frank's good, but I mean, you could have traded that pick and something else, maybe brought something else back. But I mean, you <sighs> looking back now, knowing what we know now, I don't think the Knicks would have taken Obi. I think that they would have gone somewhere else because I don't know that they thought Julius Randle was going to explode the way that he is. Um, yeah, I actually wanted the Bulls to draft Obi. Oh my God, no. I no. want to Obi because Lori Marsman, he's out after this season. No, I think he's staying. He wants to sign. They're, they're, they're working on an extension. Are they? Yeah, he wants to well, stay. Last, he, he's, last, I heard that they, last I heard is they were trying to work an extension and try to work a new deal, and neither side could come to terms because I don't think the Bulls want to pay him as much as he wants. And that they said that, that after the season's over, that he's going to become a free agent and he's going to go off somewhere else. If he's unrestricted, he can go anywhere. Obviously, if we want to bring him back, I hope he comes back. Um, I think he's kind of doing the same thing Jimmy Butler did a few years ago, bet on yourself. So maybe he's going to play the rest of the season. If he's restricted, then the ball's still on our court because we can match um, the contract. And, I mean, besides Zach Levine, and Zach Levine's contract's not even that big anymore. It's like a five-year, $90 million contract, and that's a bargain now. Because, I mean, he's already, mm -hmm. besides Zach, we have nobody – tied long term. I don't know why we signed Felice Shield to that little four year thirty two million dollar contract a couple of years ago. But that I think that's done after I looked that up the other day when I was actually in Chicago because so I'm like, you know what? Why do we have this guy still on the roster? And he's he'll be gone soon. Otto Porter's contract's expiring. So you, I mean he's gone. We might yeah. trade him at the three yeah. So I mean if marketing can prove that he um if he can prove that he can stay healthy and consistently put up numbers, I I would love to see him stay because that adds element. But if not, so if Lowry leaves, and what he was our, then I say we had to draft a we had to draft a big. And I mean, because I think like Wendell Carter, he's only listed as six nine. I feel like Wendell Carter is more of a power forward than a center, or he's a center like he's, but he he's got a power forward's height. So we need to draft another big, like a big down low. I don't know what kind of big. I mean, what? I mean, but we'd have to draft something. Or, heck, maybe we can trade Lowry to Golden State for James Wiseman. I love James Wiseman. Do we bring James Wiseman to Chicago with uh, our, our stud guards? And then you have, like, a, a guy like freaking Wendell. I mean, and James can plan a permanent to him. Hey, I mean, that would never happen, but <laughs> I can dream. But uh, I think Lowry wants to stay in Chicago, too. So I think it's, it's just going to see how he performs the rest of the year. So that would be interesting to see. Because otherwise, I mean, who else do you have signed sign long-term? Nobody. Yeah, nobody. So, and, and like you said, I think that they're in a good space right now to be able to build and yeah. be very um, welcoming to free agents coming in and then even rookies that you draft to come in and perform well right off the bat. So I think that they're going to do well. But like you said, the key to keeping marketing, can he stay healthy? And that's and that's the other reason why I was – I'd be happy – I'd be sad to see him go, but at the same time, I get it because he's he's been hurt a lot while he was with the Bulls, and yeah. you can't really make an impact if you're on the bench the entire time or on on the shelf. How many but, times have you seen? How many times have you seen athletes that play for Chicago teams repeatedly get hurt, which repeatedly underperform while they're in Chicago, and then they suddenly just end up in another team, and then they just start thriving. The Bulls had Spencer Dinwiddie at one point. Like, we got him in a – like, we had him, and we, like, traded him, which, I mean, it was like we had him once, and then we moved him right away, and then all of a sudden he's thrived. I mean, I've seen guys um, just like um, – what's this guy? J James Johnson that played for the Bulls. We drafted him in 2009. Um, he didn't really put it together. He bounced around. And then, like, now – and, I mean, he was young. I think he was, like, 19 when we had him or something like that. Mm -hmm. uh, and now, all of a sudden, you know, he's, a he's like, you know, balling out. You know, he's doing his thing. But we've had tons of players, and not just, like, NBA. I mean, NFL and, like, and this 
I can't even tell you. MLB baseball Cubs, like I mean, that big the LeMay the LeMay, 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 he just signed with the Yankees or thing or somebody. He used to play for the Cubs. I remember when we had him, like uh, DJ LeMay, and I remember he had like no power like in two thousand ten while we were rebuilding. And then we every now he just signed a six year hundred and fifty million dollar contract. I mean, we've had tons of athletes play for Chicago teams and just not really live up to um, their expectations or what you know what they expected of themselves. I mean, they or they were injured all the time. Yep. And I wouldn't be surprised if like Lowry like left and went to like another team, and all of a sudden this guy was like the next Christos Brzezing. It's like average like twenty and ten. And I'm like, why couldn't you do that in Chicago? Like you doing that with Kobe and Zach? That's a big three. Like that's you know that's that's a scary big three, and it's a young. But Lowry's only like twenty three, twenty two. He's ninety seven. He's like yeah, he's young. So even if we don't sign to a max, and we give him a two year max. You know, like, you know, so he can, like, hey, you know, you know, or, I mean, like, hey, let's, or a three-year deal, you know, opt-out call, shorter deal, you know, to, you know, and that helps his flexibility, too. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I, we, we can always go that route. We have new management, though, too, and I love our new management staff, so I definitely trust them moving forward. Yes. The new management, as I've, I've been completely happy with the new management and how they've, they've been handling things. I'm not gonna lie though. This off season, I thought Derrick Rose was coming home. I thought Derrick Rose free agency. I thought he was gonna be coming back to the Bulls, and not and not and I wasn't ex- expecting him to be anything spectacular because if if he came back and he performed half as good as he did was before his uh, before his injury, that I, w- I would have been happy. But I just yeah. thought would have been that was like a, a nice little welcome and. Nice little kickoff to the management, no, but I'm I'm ha- I'm happy with uh, I'm happy with Kobe White. <laughs> you know what? I still uh um I still think that we might bring Derrick Rose back at some point to kind of be that backup point guard, kind of like how he's because he's doing the same thing in Detroit. Detroit drafted uh Killian Hayes and the Derrick Rose coming off the bench for them. I I mean I I grew I got. Growing up in high school in Chicago, Derrick Rose was a year above me, so you we all knew he was special. And I remember watching like when he played a uh, for the city championship, and he was just special. You know, I love what he did for the Bulls. It's unfortunate with the injuries. It's unfortunate that you know he that we just could never really put a, a team together. But at the same time, too, LeBron was in the Eastern Conference for Miami or Cleveland. So I mean, going to, it was just it was just unfortunate. The same thing with the Bears and going up against Aaron Rodgers or Brett Favre. You know, all these good guys. I mean, it's just like. You guys are going up against like these Hall of Fame GOAT level godlike players, you know, in your same conference. I mean, LeBron's in the same freaking central division as you. Goes to Miami. And I I mean, how many times every year? Miami or Cleveland. Even in 2015 when he came back, Cle- I mean, I mean, like that one we were up two one that one series versus Cleveland. He hit that game winning jump shot, two yeah. four, but game, that game five, I think mean, there was a lot of missed calls and Jackson's top gets got ejected and it was like that was our best chance. That was, the, and I mean, I'm so it's tough. I still think Derrick Rose will come back to Chicago and finish off his career here at some point. He's only 32. Um, he's still relatively young, and I mean, he, and he comes off and, and it's a backup point guard and plays, you know, backup minutes. I think that's fine from a from injury standpoint. But I, I think at some point, you know, we're gonna we're gonna bring him back home, and I'm ready for that. You know, I think it's time for him to come home. You know, just bring that leadership back too, especially as young guys continue to grow up. Heck, I love to see Joakim know who I love, Joakim and Def. Not play, obviously. I think he's retired, but I'm back and there's be a coach, you know, with Donovan. You know, definitely work with our bigs because I mean, you can make. Wendell Carter so much better, you know, because Joaquin Noah was so great, you know, defense obviously, but his playmaking too, it's, it's big. That's so underrated. This man would literally get a triple double. Jokic, I mean, he was doing that before. He was doing that before Jokic was doing it with the passes. I mean, he wasn't as flashy of a passer as Jokic, but he was still a passing big man, just like Marcus Sala for the Lakers. Jokic I mean, passing the ball was as ugly as you can imagine, <laughs> but it was effective. Right, right. <laughs> it was. Ugly and effective, but he he managed to pull it off. Um, all right, last last question. I want to pick your brain before we before we sign off. Odds that Luke Garza falls to Chicago's draft position. Um, I just saw man, he, Luca was just eating too. I just saw the game versus Indiana. Man, I see, Chicago's probably going to be what. 
not lottery. I think we're going to be right outside the lottery, mid, you know, 15, 16. Big. Um, that's a high li- likelihood. It, it, that's a high likelihood. I haven't seen a lot of college basketball this year, but it just honestly depends on the the obsession with the one and done. Because it's always like, how, okay, what one and done do you take first? And then what international guys are available that are supposed to be studs? And then you start looking towards the senior. Because Luca's a senior. So, yeah. you know, they're gonna be, they're, he's going he's gonna to go in the late first. Yep. Probably even second. I, Don't be I, I, think second. Luke, I think he'll end up going anywhere between – I'm I'm an Iowa boy, so I don't want to I don't want my biased opinion to come in, but I could see him going anywhere between eight and sixteen. Yeah, it just and it depends on what teams get the picks. I mean, because you know, cause, but but the thing with Luca is, is he can shoot for a big man. I mean, because I've I've been watching, and granted, like he's got that old school form. Like he'll bring it all the way back. And I remember when I first saw him shooting. I'm like, that's not gonna go in. And then like it was like all net. And I'm like, oh, I'm like, and but then the way he shot it. He was so comfortable shooting. I'm like, oh, okay. And I've seen him shoot that before. He's like, he brings it back, like like Dirk and Whiskey, like the yep. same form, and it's good. And then like, and he plays. And like, I I've been watching more and more of Iowa because I can't wait for them to play Illinois because I think that's gonna be such a good game. But um, yeah, I think yeah. I just I mean I he if if he continues to play like this and put up these numbers, he could sneak in the lottery. A team like a team that's like maybe not good, like, like a team like Boston who has like a myriad of picks gets like a top, you know, one to get its lottery pick because one of the picks they the from from whatever they have from all those trades they had, maybe they take a guy like Luca. Yeah. You know that like, we don't need a young stuff. We can grab a, a guy like I mean, because the Knicks took freaking Obi Toppin who was already like twenty two. Um the Hawks a couple years ago took DeAndre Hunter who was like twenty two or whatever, twenty one. He was and then the lottery, these are older players. But if I, I mean, but like if he can, I think if he continues to put up these numbers, he can probably sneak in that lottery. Because Lucas, I mean, he's, I call it, I always say he's cold blooded. You know, I mean, Luke, I can't think of Luka Doncic, but Garz is cold blooded too. And Garza plays with the edge. I mean, I, and I watch a lot of Iowa basketball. He's one of the few players, I mean, he's one of the, the players in Iowa who I'm like, he plays hard and goes after it. You know what I'm saying? So looking at his numbers now as we speak, they're playing Indiana. It's tied 55 all. Eight minutes left in the second half. He's got 24 points on nine of 19 shooting, 10 rebounds, and three assists. Like that's really good. And he's got yeah nine. And he's 0 for three, like from from three. So even if he had hit one of those threes, he probably would be close to 30. He's gonna probably he's gonna finish with 30 at some point. But I mean, he just scores so effortlessly, and he's got a post game too, which I love because I'm still I still think traditional big man can, ex- can play in the NBA, but he can shoot threes. So yeah. he'll definitely he'll definitely find a role in in the NBA, but I think he can I think he can, can play himself and sneak into the lottery. Don't be surprised. I mean, yeah, you know, you want any up, upperclassmen usually fall out the lottery, but I think he's he can get to that point. I just don't want him to end up like uh, Denzel Valentine on the Bulls, and I he, love Denzel. I thought he was going to be so much better coming out of Michigan oh, State, you say- and. and Playing for the Bulls, and, I, and when I saw that they got him, I was I was extremely happy. And then I've watched him play, and I'm I just don't see the same player. What, what do you What do you want? What do you so you want? What do you want Denzel to be? You want Denzel to be a twenty and a a, a, a twenty plus scores as such such type player, or you want? I mean, I think Denzel he's the type of player for us, and I love him too. Is that he can do a little bit of everything for us. Yeah, like he's kind of like our Swiss Army knife. And I watched him in Michigan State too. And I saw like his senior year in Michigan State. He kind of exploded. Like he can shoot really good. Yeah, he, he's a capable defender, capable decision maker. He does a lot of little things for us. And I love what he does for us. I think if we want to win a championship, in Chicago, you need a player like Denzel on your team. I mean, you're not saying start or come off the bench, but he can come off the bench and he makes plays. And he's just and, he, and he's smart because he came under Tom. Not, Tom Izzo, Tom, Tom. and he yeah. un, under you say he's a smart basketball player, savvy. You know, kind of like, like Draymond Green, such and such. I actually read an article too. You know, like Tom Thibodeau was a Bulls coach, and all that friction with a uh, guard Foreman and Pax. Tom Thibodeau actually wanted the Bulls to draft Draymond Green in that 2012 draft, and they drafted Marquise T out of Kentucky. And you know, I'm looking back at that, and I'm like, you know what? If we would have had Draymond back then, we still had Luol Deng, we had Jimmy Butler, Derrick Rose is out. But then if you don't draft for Draymond Green. That defense would have been nasty. That would have been nuts. And I'm like, and then you could have just, you could you sign like Nate Robinson anyways. You could have just signed, and I'm like, and I'm always, and I learned from somebody a long time ago, which makes sense when it comes to sports and drafting. You sign for need and free agency, and you draft the best available player. 
It's like in football, I would draft the best available player. Let's say I needed a quarterback. I mean, if if I, if, I, if, the, if, I, if, I, if the best available player wasn't a quarterback, but I would look to free agency to bring a quarterback in to fill that need. And then, like each round, I would draft the best available player. And then if I and if I didn't and then if I didn't get a quarterback in that draft because I didn't find any that one, I would just roll with the guy, sign the free agency and the backup. And then my other and then my team would just have the other best available players I had. Because you you see teams do that all the time. They'll draft like, oh, we need a we need a we need a point guard. Oh, let's draft this guy and have him come in and and, and then fill that point guard spot. He's not going to come in and just suddenly be the guy you need. You're better off signing somebody who's done it before. Who you, or who could you know give you some semblance of what you need, and then draft the best available player, and then let that player develop. I mean, that's the best way to build a team. If I ever was a GM or had the chance to do, that's how I would build my team. I think it's completely genius, and I mean, which makes sense too. But yeah, I I agree I agree with that to an extent, but I think I think in basketball it's it's a little different. Um, then yeah. it, it really just depends upon the caliber of player too. Yeah. Because I mean, you're obviously going to have your guys that come in and make an immediate impact. And then you're going to have your guys that you're drafting and bringing in that, you know, that they're going to take some coaching. They're going to take a little bit of coming into their own before they start making splashes. And I guess I just, I wish Denzel would, would be scoring more and making more. that bigger of a splash that on offense when we need that's what we needed was offense to score more because the defense wasn't necessarily holding up as well as it should have. Let me look at uh Denzel's numbers. I got you on the phone now. I know Denzel's been kinda in and out of the lineup with injuries and stuff like that. And his minutes have been kind of sporadic too. That's the thing too, like with Denzel. Like I mean his last game versus um versus um Houston, he played twenty four minutes and then the game before that versus OKC, 15, 20. So he's right around the 20-minute range, which is, you know, solid. He's – uh so this year, this season, he's averaging seven – yeah, eight points, five rebounds, two assists, um, shooting 42 – 43% from the field, and shooting 41% from three, averaging a steal, and almost one turnover per, ga- per game. Yeah, I mean, his scoring could be a little better. Um, I think with our team that we have now, and I think he's—I really think he's not really focusing on scoring. I think he's more focusing on being more of a decision maker and and just making plays. Because I mean, you look at the, the Bulls now—you have Markinen, Kobe, and Zach. Those three guys can score. Thaddeus Young can come off your bench and score. I saw um, Garrett Temple and Otto Porter Jr. last week both can score. Those are bigs. Um, I mean, even uh, our backup center dude who I love, Daniel Gafford, that guy's a stud, man. We drafted him. I'm like, hey, this is a steal. I mean, he's a, I mean, he's mobile. He can rim roll. He needs more minutes, man. He's only getting – I'm like, Billy, you got to play that. I mean, he needs more minutes. So if Markinen does leave a free agency, that's fine. You move Gafford into the starting lineup, and then you just – and then you just – um, and you just um, draft – sign another big man. But I mean, I like Gafford a lot. So I mean, if we do lose marketing, I'm not tripping over that because Gafford's you know nasty. And Gafford's got a nice little low post game. I mean, Gafford, you can get a nice little mid range, you know, touch. You, I mean, you could be a lot more better. Like you're already better than DeAndre Jordan. You already have more post moves than some of these big men or Dwight Howard. You're, I mean, you already have yeah. more post moves than Dwight. You're not better than Dwight, but I mean, you have the capability to be just as good as Dwight. You know what I'm saying? With the more offensive touch. So, uh, I agree. But, all right, that's about all the time we have for tonight. Um, for fantasy sake, I'm Andrew. That's I'm Samuel. And hey, hey, guys. Sorry, go ahead, Sam. I was going to say, hey, guys, you know, if there's anything you guys want us to talk about, you know, feel free to reach out. You know, our Twitter handles are below. You know, I love talking about basketball, as I'm sure Andrew is. That's why we are doing this on a Thursday night. Um, but, yeah, just let us know, you know, let and what if there's any topics you want us to talk about or anything, you know, we're – you know, we're new to this and we're learning um, and we're all excited. So, yeah, you know, if there's anything that you want to see us talk about, you know, feel free to tweet us below and uh, we'll definitely talk about it on the next show. Definitely. That's a great point. We will see you guys next Thursday. Take care. Take care.